Okay, so uh, uh, introductions aside, uh, I'm going to go ahead and say again, my name is Stan Bosarge, and uh, welcome to my presentation, A Spatial and Ecological Approach to Artificial Reef Placement. Uh, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, this talk centers around an ongoing survey effort of the Fisheries Ecology Lab of the University of South Alabama's Department of Marine Sciences, which is located at the Dolphin Island Sea Lab. Uh, the survey is called the uh, Fisheries Independent Ecosystem Survey, which I refer to here as FIES, uh, since acronyms are easier to say for uh, lazy speakers like me. So at this point, I'd like to uh, also stress that this is still a, a work in progress, and, and what I'm presenting today is, is still very much preliminary. So the first question would be, what is FIES? Uh, I'm not going to read the slide for you, but I will say that FIES is a tremendous effort annually uh, conducted by our lab and the uh, Alabama Marine Resources Division, all centered around our guest of honor here, which is uh, Lujanus Campuchanus, or Red Snapper. <clears throat> so the next question is, how do we do it? Um, this graphic uh, pretty effectively summarizes the FIES effort. Uh, we start with habitat surveying, uh, utilizing side scan sonar uh, to map the locations of artificial and natural reefs. Uh, and then we uh, use uh, those locations as the sampling domain for the remaining fishing effort, uh, which consists of uh, ROV video, uh, vertical long line, bottom long line, and trawl sampling. So the next question is where do we do this? Uh, our survey area begins about 10 nautical miles south of the mouth of Mobile Bay. Uh, it's approximately uh, 49 nautical miles long by 43 nautical miles wide and extends east and west to the lateral state line boundaries of Alabama. Now, originally, our survey effort uh, was con contained to uh, just the, uh, the uh, shapes or the geometries to the, to the left or to the east, uh, but we later expanded to the west for uh, sort of a control comparison. But uh, for the purpose of this, oh, I'm going to need to go ahead and explain what these, these groupings are. Uh, the grids themselves, the small rectangular grids, are one square nautical mile grids, and they are uh, partitioned off into a depth strata of uh, 60 to 120 feet, 120 to 180, and 180 to 360. And if you see the small purple sliver there on the, uh, on the bottom uh, left, or bottom right for your view, uh, that area is actually excluded only because we had some limitations to uh, depth for our sensors. So, uh, and plus there's, there's primarily artificial or natural habitat there, so we excluded that. So grid selection uh, for our effort is completely randomized uh, with exclusion. In other words, we, we randomly pick cells within the grid array uh, with the intent of never revisiting that cell so that we're constantly surveying uh, new cells each and every time we do a selection for, uh, for survey effort. So I, I show all of the survey area here, but the concentration for the analysis is going to be just for this, this side of the, uh, the, the grid array. So uh, why do we do this? Um, you'll see in this graphic here, I've, I've gone ahead and highlighted where the, uh, the analysis, analysis extent will take place for this. And uh, the reason why the, um, we do this is because uh, red snapper stocks in Alabama support uh, multi-million dollar recreational commercial fisheries. And it's believed that all of this is due to uh, the Alabama artificial reef permit program um, because the vast majority of habitat that's located within the permit zone is going to be artificial reefs. Uh, right now, it's currently estimated that there are uh, around 876 uh, uh, publicly known reefs within the permit zone. But from our survey efforts uh, with the sonar, we, we estimate that to be around somewhere around 7,777, which that's an interesting number. Uh, one of the most noticeable things about this map is the, the regularized, oops, sorry, regularized distribution of uh, artificial reefs that have been planted by the state. <laughs> Uh, they typically follow lines of latitude and longitude uh, with a lot of equal spacing. And, and again, the, uh, the reef, pla reef placement activities up until now sort of take place without any knowledge of what existing structure may be there, uh, whether that be uh, private reefs or uh, natural reef structure. And so uh, I hope with this analysis to, to sort of change that, uh, that decision-making process. So um, I'll just go through a couple of action photos here. Uh, this is our habitat survey. Uh, with sonar originally, uh, oh, we actually work off of a 95-foot research vessel called the Kimberly Dawn, uh, deploying for 10-day uh, deployments for a grand total of about 30 survey days per year. And in that time, we uh, collect about 60 nautical miles worth of data per year. 
Uh, we started out with a, uh, a toad side scan, but we're now utilizing this uh, swath bathymetry system in which we can actually collect uh, uh, 3D uh, bathymetric models as well as side scan. And then we've got some uh, uh, pictures here of some nice uh, natural features that we've, we've come across. Um, the next part of the, the survey effort is going to be uh, ROV. So again, we, we find the locations for these guys to go out and, and further investigate. So the first level of reef, uh, reef specific uh, um, investigation will begin with the ROV. And of course, some of the artificial reef uh, examples we have are M60 tank, uh, pyramids of various uh, construction material, and then chicken coops, which are basically just uh, steel cages that are lashed together in various sizes and configurations. And uh, by far, for, uh, I want to go ahead and say here that uh, chicken coops are the basically primary habitat of choice for private reef placement because they're much uh, cheaper to manufacture. So the next step will be uh, in the reef level sampling following the RV work is to actually uh, sample the reef using a vertical long line. I'm not sure if anybody any of you are familiar with vertical long line, but it's basically hook and line, but on steroids. And uh, it removes any uh, angler bias because we, we basically send down baited hooks uh, for a time period of time and then just uh, for a specific time interval and then pull those, pull those hooks up. And so that we can um, then express or standardize our, our catch effort or uh, CPUE. And in our case, it'll be the number of fish caught per five minute soak. Um, and also, uh, at this time, not depicted here, we'll also collect abiotic uh, parameters uh, such as uh, salinity, temperature, and dissolved oxygen. Uh, so for this analysis, uh, I'll be dealing with just the, uh, the catch rates from the vertical long line as well as using the uh, abiotic measurements taken from the, uh, from the seafloor right around the reef area. Uh, so the next step would be uh, grid level sampling. So we're, we're going to um, set out uh, a bottom long line set specifically intended to target uh, larger predatory species as well as the uh, larger cohorts of the uh, red snapper population, such as this one pictured here on the left. Uh, so that, that's, a, that's a happy guy right there. Big fish, lots of happiness. And then finally, on the, uh, the grid level sampling, uh, we do uh, trawl work uh, within the grid. And so we also use the, uh, the sonar data to inform our uh, our decisions on trawl paths within those uh, grids to avoid uh, snagging the trawl uh, on existing structure. So, um, and the other thing I want to mention too is that the, um, this is intended to, to capture the, um, the juvenile component of the, the red snapper uh, population. So, FISE occurs uh, prior to and following red snapper fishing uh, so that we can also examine the effects of intense fishing effort exerted during the season. So, what, what we see here is a tremendous amount of effort by many and many passionate and dedicated folks producing high quality and highly actionable data uh, used in the Gulf wide red snapper stock assessment. So a worthy cause, but I was still left wondering uh, what more could we do with this data. So, no, not working. <clears throat> so any, uh, any decent spatial analysis will start with a problem statement in this case, uh, it's how can we leverage the data we collect in such a way as to guide state resource managers uh, in their reef placement or enhancement activities. And of course, this is important since if we can, this will hopefully provide a decision framework for, for future reef placement with the aim of enhancing the fishery, which is good for the state, uh, as well as provide a framework for experimental design to test if this approach works or not, which is good for our lab, and that it may provide uh, potential projects for in incoming graduate students to explore. So uh, presented here is the graphical representation of the workflow. Um, everything above the, uh, the purple dotted line is what's going to be covered uh, in this analysis. Everything below this would be what would follow after we uh, run the analysis, analysis and actually specify uh, the sites. And, and so the analysis is basically a weighted uh, overlay analysis, but with some variations as, as we'll, we'll see. So the first thing, uh, the first thing in the process is uh, is data extraction. So this is the current data spread, and this uh, this actually involves all of the uh, vertical long line stations that we've uh, that we've uh, sampled at uh, sonar contacts that we've generated, as well as uh, sonar grids. And again, since I mentioned we're, we're shifting the focus to the uh, to the red polygon layer, then uh, we would go ahead and start isolating the data to those locations, and then finally summarize. Uh, 
the observations into uh, this series of point layers. So uh, I do want to say that there's not complete overlap of abiotic data to catch data to contact data only because we, we excluded some of the catch data from the very first year because our, uh, our methodology for collection changed. Uh, but we still wound up using the abiotic data from those locations. And then finally, the contact data, um, I'm one year ahead of uh, the fisheries collection efforts, so I actually have a full year's component of habitat data that I don't have associated catch data with, but I wanted to, to utilize all the available data in order to create a series of predictive surfaces, as, uh, as we'll see. So the next, uh, next step in the process is to uh, analyze the, uh, the data, or the summary data for trends. And uh, so da data trends were examined using a combination of exploratory regression analysis and ordinary least squares regression analysis tools in, in ArcGIS. Expl uh, exploratory regression was useful in, in paring down the explanatory variables to the ones listed here, which are um, dissolved oxygen, salinity, temperature, uh, and then in addition to that, uh, for the habitat side, I used uh, total artificial reef volume per grid, total natural reef volume per grid, and average depth. Um, and then once, once I uh, finished with the, uh, the exploratory regression, I then started feeding these into the ordinary least squares regression tool, or OLS. And uh, I'll just go on record as saying so OLS regression analysis uh, results were pretty iffy. It was obvious to me after trying to specify the model through data transformations and data outlier exclusion that the uh, results of the regression would not improve. So uh, this is likely due to the fact that the relationships are not linear. So I'll recognize here that OLS regression is not the best model uh, for these relationships between dependent and explanatory variables and that exploration of an alternative model such as, of catch response, such as a generalized linear model or generalized additive model, or GAM, uh, will hopefully work better. GAM in particular, um, since uh, what I was told by our, our, our stats guru, is that uh, it's, it's more flexible and fitting nonlinear relationships. However, time didn't allow for this, so the remainder of the workflow will incorporate the results of the OLS uh, with the understanding that uh, we'll be revisiting this uh, later on. So uh, OLS does provide an R-squared and adjusted R-squared value for the entire model, but not for each individual variable. So I quickly uh, ran um, the regression analysis through, uh, or plots through uh, Excel for each one of the um, abiotic variables, as well as the uh, depth, and then artificial reef volume and natural reef volume. And the reason why I did this is because I wanted to, to, to grab the slope um, the slope value as well as R squared in order to apply significance and weights to the, uh, to the variables. So uh, these will factor in later into the analysis. And then the, the next step is I wanted to create some uh, prediction surfaces and anybody that's familiar with interpolations uh, knows that this involves another level of, of data exploration. So I ran through the, uh, the data exploration tools uh, provided in uh, Geostatistical Analyst in order to um, in order to examine trends within the data, uh, particularly the trend analysis, uh, uh, pretty much every one of the uh, variables that we looked at have a, have a, a west to east uh, trend as well as a, a, a north to south. So it's, it's, it's stratifying on um, salinity as we move to the east and then depth as we move, uh, as we move south. So, uh, um, and also I examined the, uh, the semivariogram and covariance clouds and then finally did uh, spatial autocorrelation by distance to figure out what the search radius was going to be for the, uh, the neighbors used in the interpolation. So these are the, uh, the predicted surfaces. I, I used uh, empirical Bayesian Kriging uh, for the interpolation because uh, it, it, I, I like the fact that you can, you can feed uh, or you can select how many uh, simulations that you want to run in order to figure out what your variograms are for the model. Um, and so I, I did this for, uh, for DO, as well as uh, salinity, temperature, and then finally I ran one just to, to see what the model would predict, predict in terms of uh, catch rates for red snapper. And then it was actually at this point when I looked at uh, the total reef volume prediction that I realized I was going to have to split uh, between natural and artificial reefs because the uh, the data are so overwhelmingly weighted to the south because that's where all the natural reef uh, is. So that produced, uh, from that I, I derived these surfaces. This is artificial reef, uh, which the distribution pattern is, 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 is as expected, and then uh, natural reef, which again you see the weight uh, 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 is predominantly down to the, to the south. 
So in addition to the prediction surfaces, I also generated uh, prediction standard error surfaces for all the, um, for all the variables. And, and the reason for this is I wanted to see how the uh, prediction models compared to the, uh, the actual observation models. And I'm going to actually incorporate the uh, prediction standard errors into the, uh, into the overall analysis. So finally, uh, the next step will be, or not finally, but the next step will be surface reclassification. And this is essentially a big summary table that I generated in order to uh, figure out how it's going to reclassify. Um, so um, data ranges were reclassified for each explanatory variable using natural data breaks in five classes, with five being the, the most optimal, one being the least. Slope from the regression trend lines was used to order the classes such that a scale of one through five represents a positive correlation, five through one is negative, and then weights were taken from the R-squared values as the percentage of each variable value divided by the sum of all R-squared values. So the prediction standard error is, is also included in here since I wanted to prioritize the overall selection towards areas in which I have the highest confidence in those predictions, or in the prediction surface values. So uh, the reclassification sort of looks like this. This is a, this is a, a graphical representation. So here's the, the salinity prediction reclass. Uh, then I take the, uh, the prediction standard error and reclassify that into a binary raster. And so through um, um, multipli multiplication in the uh, raster calculator, I multiply this surface by the previous surface in order to generate the final salinity reclassification, re uh, prediction reclass. So essentially, I'm masking out the areas that I have the least amount of confidence in. Um, so then, um, once that's done, um, we move on to, to the primary model. So the previous four slides appear to indicate that I, that I performed all of these processes independently of each other, when in fact, once the original interpolated surfaces were created, I, I built the geoprocessing model uh, pictured here in anticipation of repeating uh, all of this work once additional data become available and a more appropriate model of catch response is specified. So my intent uh, at some point in time is to expand upon this geoprocessing model to incorporate the data extraction and transformation um, from the database and uh, just automate the entire process. So aside from that, the, the model performs all of the classifications, raster multiplications, and then feeds the outputs into the weighted overlay tool, which is also fed the, uh, the weighted percentages calculated from their R-squared values. Uh, all that's left to do is, is run the model and then map the results. So here are the preliminary results. Um, this is the rasterized version. Um, two through five being, uh, two being the least optimal areas, five being the most optimal areas. And then from that, uh, you, would, you would do a transformation to a uh, polygon layer in which you could then uh, begin to select areas that you want to investigate further. And so in this case, I selected the, uh, the largest area with the, uh, the highest uh, weighted value, which is the one that's uh, highlighted. And then from there, we can, we can zoom that in and, and look at how this overlays with sites that we may have already visited, as well as uh, sites that we could use as candidates for uh, more directed studies that have not been explored uh, whatsoever. So at, at this point, um, my analysis would stop because, or for the, for the purpose of the talk, would stop because now we're, we're gonna, working into areas that are below the purple line. You guys remember the purple line? Yeah, so we're, we're now moving into that area now. So, um, oh, and then finally, we, we would select the grids. I, I forgot to click once more, so this kind of puts it in context. We, this actually winds up selecting about 15 square nautical miles worth of, of grids, and within those grids that are selected, we have at least one candidate grid that we just recently surveyed. So we could immediately go ahead and start uh, taking that data and start developing some parameters for how we would place the reefs. And then, of course, two of the grids were collected in 2016. Those could possibly be used if we, if we have a strong amount of confidence that no additional structure has been placed in those areas. And then there's, of course, one that's uh, from the very beginning of the survey, which uh, we definitely want to revisit that one. So uh, concluding remarks, and sorry if I'm going over time. <laughs> so the, the final output area was smaller than expected, and I, and I feel that uh, that's probably due to the fact that I gated all of this uh, using the, uh, the standard error prediction surfaces. So uh, possibly either relaxing that, that condition or uh, collecting more data in the areas that we have the least uh, confidence in the prediction would help. Uh, again, go back to, uh, circle back to, to GAM. Linear regression models are, are probably not appropriate. GAM would probably work best. And so that then feeds into uh, exploring our bridge for ArcGIS to run GAM and then also other, um, 
options for relationships within the ESRI uh, toolbox and then looking at other species. So that's it. <laughs>